So this is module two of test one of the four paper practice tests for the new digital SAT. That's a mouthful. So we'll start here. Number one, for painter Jacob Lawrence, being blank was an important part of the artistic process. And we certainly don't have enough to answer it, so we're going to read as far as we need to read in order to answer it. Might be the whole blurb here. So because he paid close attention to all the details of his Harlem neighborhood, his artwork captured nuances in the beauty and vitality of the black experience. Okay, so he paid close attention. He captured nuances. So he was observant. And I look down and I see that that actual word is there. But I want to reinforce here that with these questions, and there are going to be, what, six of them? I want to think of a word that goes in the blank and then look at the choices. And I promise you I wasn't cheating there. I wasn't looking down. So, observant. Two, this person and others are studying the freshwater stingray species such and such to determine whether biological characteristics such as the rays as age and sex have blank effect on the toxicity of their venom. And then we have our clue that, hey, here's where our definition is coming, essentially. That is, to see if their differences in these traits are associated with considerable variations in venom potency have a size have a considerable effect a large effect a substantial effect so in these questions both the dash the single dash that's going to set up some kind of explanation and the colon both act as a similar clue that tells you hey here comes an explanation of the material right before it and that's definitely what we have there. Number three, researchers have struggled to pinpoint specific causes for hiccups, which happens when a person's diaphragm contracts in a certain way, a certain way. However, this neuroscientist has found that these uncontrollable contractions, and that's all we need to get our answer, contracts uncontrollably. And I'm doing this, you can't tell where my eyes are focused, but I'm telling you I'm not looking at the answer choices. I can also tell you that uncontrollably won't be an answer, but the answer will be a close match for it, and that's exactly what we have. So involuntarily, if it's involuntary, there is no voluntary control over it. So definitely not smoothly, beneficially doesn't make any sense, and then strenuously is an example of one of those words that might seem to be tempting if you plugged it in. But you really want to be thinking proactively here, thinking what kind of word needs to go in the blank. Number four, number four. Critics have asserted that fine art and fashion rarely blank in a world where artists create timeless works for exhibition and designers periodically produce new styles for the public to buy. Somebody challenges this view. Her work can be seen in the metropolitan, okay, so my, the first thing I thought was not correct. This uh, artwork, this artist and designer challenges this view. Her work can be seen in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and purchased through her online boutique. Oh, okay. I was thinking that we're gonna have a contrast between things that don't last and things that are timeless. It's going to be coexist. Why? Because we have fine art, a museum of art, we have online boutique and fashion. So the idea is that these things can be, can go along with one another. They can coexist. They can intersect. Five, scholarly discussions of gender in Shakespeare's comedies often celebrate the rebellion of the playwright's characters against the rigid expectations blank by Elizabethan society. Most of the comedies end in marriage with characters returning to their socially dictated gender roles. So, society socially dictated, dictated. If they're socially dictated, they're dictated by the society. They are prescribed, prescribed. Kind of like a doctor prescribes medication and says, take this. Society is prescribing roles and saying, do this. And we want to keep in mind that prescribed is not the same thing as proscribed. That means prohibited. 
and we don't need to worry about these other words. We're thinking about the word that goes in the blank, and that's going to lead us there, and we don't need to second guess or overanalyze the other words. Number six, in studying the use of external stimuli to reduce the itching sensation caused by an allergic histamine response, Louise Ward and colleagues found that while harmless applications of vibration or warming can provide a temporary distraction, such blank stimuli actually offer less relief than a stimulus, stimulus that seems less benign. Okay, such harmless, now harmless, uh, maybe mild, I mean we could say benign as well, benign, mild, harmless, because they're going to offer less relief than something that seems less benign, less mild, less harmless, less innocuous 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 you can look in a thesaurus and you'll see all of those words together they're not going to mean the exact same thing but they're going to be pretty close together so innocuous 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 stimuli and even one more of these i've seen on the digital versions where they might only give two or three of these before moving into other question types but anyway seven of them here so the province of X was situated on the Pacific coast, hundreds of kilometers southeast of Chinochitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire. Because X's location within the empire was so blank, these other goods could reach there only after a long journey. So it was very remote. It was far out. It was peripheral. So central, peripheral, periphery, kind of like perimeter. It's on the edges, not near the center. And so that wraps up the seven words in context questions from this module. And on to the next type. This will be probably an assortment of different types of questions where you have to do a little bit of reading comprehension. So the main purpose... Jane works as a governess at Thornfield Hall. I went on with my day's business tranquilly, but ever and anon, let's not worry about that, but vague, sensation, vague suggestions kept wandering across my brain of reasons why I should quit Thornfield, and I kept volunt involuntarily framing advertisements and pondering conjectures about new situations. These thoughts I did not think to check. They might germinate and bear fruit if they could. Uh, the main purpose is to uh, describe Jane's inner thoughts. And more specifically about Thornfield. Okay, so A, we don't have any indication of her outward state, you know, how she appears outward, so we can't have a contrast between it. We don't see anything about her loyalty. Determination to secure employment outside of Thornfield Hall. Why I should quit Thornfield. New situations. Conjectures are like speculations. Yeah, C, I mean, she probably seems to find it challenging or at least unfulfilling, but not deeply fulfilling, so that would need to be D. Number nine. We're comparing things, but not like on the current or old SAT, depending on when you watch this, uh, not having to deal with long passages, so just these short ones. And they want to know what the author of text 2 would most likely say about text 1's characterization of the discovery. So first we want to make sure we understand how text 1 characterizes this discovery. So, most animals can regenerate some parts of their bodies, such as skin. But when a three-banded panther worm is cut into three pieces, each piece grows into a new worm. Yuck. Researchers are investigating this feat partly to learn more about humans' comparatively limited abilities to regenerate. So if you cut a human into three parts, you won't get three new humans, so don't try that at home. Uh, they're making exciting progress. An especially promising discovery is that both humans and panther worms have a gene for early growth response linked to regeneration. 
the discovery, well, it's exciting. It is uh, promising. So that is text one's characterization. So how is t author of text two going to respond to that? When this scientist and her team reported that panther worms, like humans, possess a gene for EGR, it caused excitement. However, so they're positive, they're going to be negative. As the team pointed out, the gene likely functions very differently in humans than it does in panther worms. Scientist has likened EGR to a switch that activates other genes in regeneration in panther worm, but how this switch operates in humans remains unclear. So it's going to be something um, at least skeptical or questioning. It's not going to be extremely negative, but it's also not going to be positive. That's not it. They have not clarified how it functions in humans. That seems good. It's overly optimistic. No, that's, 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 that's just not... That's not, it's unfairly dismissive. No. One is not dismissive. One is the opposite of dismissive. Yeah, so it's the second one says that the first one is overly optimistic, meaning that the second one is a little more pessimistic or skeptical. Shakespeare. The following text is adapted from Shakespeare's 1609 poem, Sonnet 27. The poem is addressed to a close friend as if he were physically present. And full disclosure, I have seen this one. This one also appears on digital uh, Blue Book Test 1, but that's okay. Weary with toil, I hurry to my bed. The dear repose rest for limbs with travel tired. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's works expired. So body is done for the day, but mind is still going. For then my thoughts, far from where I abide, rest my thoughts begin a zealous, enthusiastic pilgrimage or voyage to thee, the close friend, and keep my drooping eyelids open wide. So there is Shakespeare, or at least the narrator, with wide eyes at night saying, I can't sleep, or I don't want to sleep because I'm thinking about you. Sleep, sleeper is, speaker is not asleep. We don't know about planning an upcoming trip. That's too literal. Nope, not too fatigued. Thinking about the friend instead of immediately falling asleep. So thinking about the friend, my thoughts, my thoughts begin a pilgrimage to thee. And that keeps the eyelids open wide so they're not a falling asleep immediately. So that'll be D. Eleven. Following is adapted from Lewis Carroll's satirical novel, Sylvia and Bruno, a crowd has gathered outside a room belonging to the warden. How does Lord Chancellor respond to the crowd? And I think I've seen this one too, but that's okay. Uh, one man, who was more excited than the rest, flung his hat high into the air and shouted, as well as I could make out, Who roar for the sub-warden? Let's not get distracted by little grammatical quirks in the older... Uh, language or things that would seem quirky now. Let's just say who roars for the subwarden. Everybody roared, but whether it was for the subwarden or not did not clearly appear. It wasn't clear whether they were roaring for the subwarden or for some other reason. Some were shouting bread and some taxes, but no one seemed to know what it was they really wanted. So mob shouting somewhat incoherently. All this I saw from the open window of the warden's breakfast saloon, looking across the shoulder of the Lord Chancellor. What can it all mean? He kept repeating to himself. I never heard such shouting before, and at this time of the morning, too, and with such unanimity. So someone is saying unanimity, uh, that is... Uh, uh, that's... Lord Chandler, and thinking it's unanimous, but it doesn't seem that it actually was unanimous. Aha, D. Yeah. He describes the crowd as being united or unanimous. 
even though the crowd appears otherwise, because some were shouting for this, some were shouting for that, but no one seemed to know what they wanted yet. A little bit challenging at first to figure out who was talking where. 12. O Pioneers is a 1913 novel by Willa Cather. In the novel, Cather portrays Alexandra Bergson as having a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Blank. Oh, okay, so kind of weird here that this is setting up the passage. This is the passage. Okay, uh, we need a quotation that illustrates the claim. What is the claim? Either that Alexandra Bergson has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings or that Cather portrays Alexandra Bergson as having a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. So, A, she had never known much before how the country meant to her, the chirping of the insects, etc. She felt as if her heart were hiding down there with the quail. Yeah, so that seems really good, but let's check the others. Nope, that's too specific. That's about farming. That's more about some kind of light imagery. Definitely not that. So the key in a question like this is really to pay attention to you know the instructions. And if they mention a claim, as they do here, make sure to understand the claim. Uh, quite similar to questions on the current SAT where they ask you for something that you know provides an example or uh, provides a topic sentence for the paragraph. You need to pay attention to what the question is asking and then find that part of the passage and then find the answer that goes along with that. Okay, so 13. A group of researchers working in Europe, Asia, and Oceania conducted a study to determine how quickly different Eurasian languages are typically spoken. And they're going to ask us for data that supports the claim. So again, we need to make sure we read all the way down to understand the claim. No need to just skip ahead, though. There's plenty of time to read everything that we need to read. Okay, so how, how uh, quickly they're spoken and how much information they can convey. They found that, although languages vary widely in the speed at which they are spoken, the amount of information they can convey tends to vary much less. So here they're varying from 5.9 to 7.7. .7. Here it is varying from 33.8 to 42. But uh, percentage-wise, percentage -wise, perhaps uh, that's not as great of a difference. Right? If you were to think of this, yeah. The, so uh, absolute difference, there's more variation here, but but percentage difference, there's uh, yeah, less differentiation there. Okay, so the claim that the two languages, that two languages with very different spoken rates can nonetheless, they claim that, okay, they claim that two languages with very different spoken rates can convey the same information. Okay, so we need to have two languages with very different rates. So probably either Thai and Spanish or maybe Vietnamese and Spanish. Among the five languages in the label, no, it's not that. That's it. Vietnamese and Spanish convey information at approximately the same rate, despite being spoken uh, at a slower rate. 14. These psychologists have argued that experiencing awe, a sensation of reverence and wonder typically brought on by perceiving something grand or powerful, can enable us to feel more connected to others and thereby inspire us to act more altruistically. Keltner, along with these others, claims to have found evidence for this effect in a recent study where participants were asked to either gaze up at exceptionally tall trees in a nearby grove, reported to be a universally awe-inspiring experience, or stare at the exterior of a nearby nondescript building. After one minute, an experimenter deliberately spilled a box of pens nearby. So the idea here would be that the participants who gazed up at tall trees were more likely to pick up the pens. To act altruistically is to act unselfishly. 
Okay, participants who had been looking up at the trees helped the experimenter pick up significantly more pens than did, than did the... So that, that is very good, and that's probably all we need, but let's check the others. No. Nope, that's reversing the direction of the comparison. And that's not relevant. So it's all about what are the relevant variables here. They're placed into two different groups, looking at the trees or looking at the building, the experimenter. This is kind of like uh, like the control group maybe, and you know, in the sense that there's no awe experience when looking at a nondescript building. This is the experimental group. The idea is that the ones in that group are going to behave more altruistically and pick up the pins that the experimenter so deviously dropped. Okay. Employment by sector in France and the United States. Over the past 200 years, the percentage of the population employed in the agricultural sector has declined in both France and in the United States. While employment in the service sector has risen. This transition happened at very different rates in the two countries. So um, we can see that if we compare uh, maybe between 1900 and 1950, that's a relatively small drop off and that's a big drop off here. Um, you know, that's pretty similar. That's pretty similar. That was a bigger jump than that. So this can most clearly be seen by comparing the employment sectors in the two countries in 1900 with that in 1950. Yeah. And I think the first time I did it in the digital one, I was, I was not. First, it's hard to see over here on the digital one because uh, the, the screen kind of wants to, you have to scroll over horizontally to see all of the table. The other thing is you can't annotate on the page very easily. Certainly not with a pen like this for these videos, but during the test it's hard for the student to annotate. There's no way to annotate like down to highlight a column. And in this case we don't need to worry about the manufacturing portion. So one of the columns that we need services is kind of hidden in the blue book. Um, it's blue book test one, module one where that question appears. Okay, uh, many archaeologists will tell you that categorizing X, so we want something that would most directly support the researcher's claim. So many archaeologists will tell you that by categorizing excavated fragments of pottery by style, period, and what objects they belong to relies not only on standard criteria, but also on instinct developed over years of practice. In a recent study, however, Researchers trained a deep learning computer model on thousands of images of pottery fragments and found that it could categorize them as accurately as a team of expert archaeologists. Some archaeologists have expressed concern that they might be replaced by such computer models. Yes, but the researchers claim that that outcome is highly unlikely. So a reason why computer models would not be likely to replace archaeologists. That would not be a reason. That would be another reason for archaeologists to worry. We need something that shows us that archaeologists are better than computers. One might be one to circle and come back to, but let's see. An instinct developed over years of practice. Oh, yeah. It's going to be that one. Okay. So the idea here is this, that currently 
uh, archaeologists who who do this sort of thing have to spend a lot of time on it, and it keeps them from doing other stuff that, as it says here, only human experts can do. So if these AI programs, these computer models, were able to take over this particular work, the archaeologists could dedicate more time to other important tasks that only human experts can do, at least until they figure out a way to have computers do those as well. But yeah, so our answer is in 16 is going to be C. 17, although military veterans, so logically completing the text, so although military veterans make up a small proportion of the total population of the United States, they occupy a significantly higher proportion of the jobs in the civilian government. One possible explanation for this disproportionate representation is that military service familiarizes people with certain organizational structures that are also reflected in the civilian government bureaucracy, and this familiarity thus makes them more likely to do those jobs, to work in government. You know, things like following orders, reporting to a boss, makes civilian government jobs especially appealing to military veterans. Eighteen. Birds, okay, same same prompt as number 17. Birds of many species ingest foods containing carotenoids, pigmented molecules that are converted into feather coloration. Coloration tends to be especially saturated in male birds' feathers, and because carotenoids also confer or result in health benefits, the deeply saturated colors generally serve to communicate what is known as an honest signal of a bird's overall fitness to potential mates. They serve as an honest signal to potential mates of a bird's overall fitness. However, this ornithologist, a person who studies birds, has found that males in several species use microstructures in their feathers to manipulate light, creating the appearance of deeper saturation without the birds necessarily having to maintain a carotenoid-rich diet. These findings suggest that their coloring is not a, a faithful or honest uh, signal. And this suggests that these birds themselves are you know, being devious, and it's not likely that that's the case, but some kind of evolutionary... Um, sort of mimicry is at work here. They may be less. Nope, eff- nope, 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 nope. Nope. If it is not an honest signal, it is a dishonest signal. In other words, they can appear healthy but not really be healthy. And you can think of all kinds of plastic surgeries and things like that in humans that could be kind of analogies. This book is hot off the presses, 2021. When writing The Other Black Girl, novelist so-and-so drew on her experiences working at a publishing office. The award-winning book is Harris's first novel, but her writing has been honored before. Okay, so we're on to the portion of the test that is like the writing section of the current SAT. So 18, I would say, is still part of the reading portion. Everything from here on out is going to fit like the, is going to be like the current section two. Um, So this is, so these you don't necessarily have to read the entire thing. But the idea here is we have a subject writing. Writing is a singular noun it's a it's a gerund it's an ing word like walking running walking is good exercise her writing we need a singular and all three of the incorrect ones are plural so we don't really have to even get into the verb tense issue it's all about subject verb agreement singular versus plural the alvarez theory developed in 1980 by so and so maintained that the secondary effects of an asteroid impact caused many dinosaurs and other animals to die out, but it left unexplored the... Yeah. So we definitely need a comma here. And what's going on here is we've got our first independent clause. 
up to and including the word out. And then we've got a comma. And then we've got our second independent clause here. So if you're going to join two independent clauses, two things that could stand on their own as sentences, if you're going to join them together with a comma, you also need a conjunction, a fanboy's conjunction, such as but, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Those are the ones that join with the comma to give us a proper compound sentence. 21, in winter, so we see here, force, for, okay, so, blah, blah, blah. We don't, I'm not even going to read that first sentence. Although the monkeys prefer to eat vegetation and land-dwelling invertebrates, those food sources may become unavailable because of extensive snow and ice cover, forcing the monkeys to hunt. And I don't even want to get into grammatical terminology there. We're just going to move on. Um, we just need something that... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could say we've got an introductory dependent clause there. We've got our main clause. And then we want to turn this into, uh, I believe we would call that a participle phrase. Another kind of dependent clause. 22. So-and-so observe that. Okay, so which? Okay, so they're going to, this has to do with forming a question properly. If these plants were grown in alkaline soil alongside grasses that aid in iron solubilization, blank, 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 blank. So it can't be A because you don't want to ask a question and have a period. It can't be C because you don't want to say, state something that isn't a question and put a question mark at the end of it, even though people will sometimes write that way informally, like in a text message. Dinner tonight? Not technically a question, but the question mark suggests that you know it's being posed as, as such. Now, he was determined to find out Hmm, hmm, hmm. I feel like it could be either B or D, but it's got to be just one. So, alongside grass is it? Let's circle it and come back to it, but let's see. If. If it rains, will the driveway get muddy? If it rains, could the driveway get muddy? Yes. I hope not. If these plants were grown in alkaline soil, could the blueberries thrive? He was determined to find out. If the plants were grown in alkaline soil, the blueberries could thrive. I think it, what comes after it suggests that we really do need a question there. It's kind of a strange one, strange one. Uh, I will check the answer to make sure, and if I missed it, I'll come back to it. In his 1963 exhibition, Namjoon Paik showed how television images could be manipulated today he is. So that is the key there, today. We don't want to say today he was, today he will be, or today he had been. In the future, he will be. Before this other thing happened, he had been. In the past, he was, but today he is. 24, the first computerized spreadsheet, Dan Bricklin's VisiCalc, Improved financial record keeping not only by providing users with an easy means of adjusting data in spreadsheets, but also by automatically updating all calculations that were dependent on these adjustments. Prior to VisiCalc's release, changing a paper spreadsheet often required redoing the entire sheet by hand to process it. Yeah. So they call these questions ones having to do with boundaries, meaning boundaries between one sentence and the next, or one clause and the next. 
And it's really just about reading it. And I would say um, sometimes if you really need to simplify things, you could el eliminate non-essential wording. I'll, I'll talk about these in a separate video. Um, yeah, but... Um, careful reading, careful reading, and, and perhaps simplifying of complex sentences is the recipe on those questions. 25. In order to prevent non-native fish species from moving freely between the Mediterranean and the Red Seas, so-and-so proposed, okay, the lock would increase the salinity of the lakes and create a natural barrier. So again, on these questions, you, I, I, you know, you don't have to read every single word. That really applies when we get into this portion, starting after, you know, on this test here, after uh, starting with number 19. You know, I hesitate to say you don't have to read everything, but I want to be honest. You know, on the early part of it, we do, I think we do want to read everything. With these, we only need to read as much as is necessary to get the particular question. And this one is strictly about verb form, verb tense, singular, plural, etc. And we really just need the current sentence. Despite being cheap, versatile, and easy to produce, something, something, something. We need something that um, first establishes an antecedent for the word they, a noun that the word they can refer to. Oh, the other thing is this. This portion here is a modifier. It's an opening phrase, clause, that is describing a noun. And the noun that it's describing needs to come right after it. So modifier, noun, or we could say subject, meaning the whatever noun that this modifier is modifying needs to come right after it. So, I mean like right after the comma. And so it's going to be D. What is cheap, versatile, and easy to produce? It's commercial plastics. It is not there. <laughs> it is not two problems, and it is not commercial plastics, two associated problems. It is commercial plastics. So that would be, yes, a dangling modifier question. Where dangling, we don't want a dangling modifier. The wrong ones would give us dangling modifiers. We want our modifier to be attached to or adjacent to the subject that it's modifying. Stomata, tiny pore structures in a... Okay, so. In a pivotal 2007 article, plant cell biologist Yuri Lee showed that... Okay, so one thing I'll say about questions like this is if you're trying... You have a role like biologist or painter or something like that. It's either going to be two commas or no comma. Meaning, this one, which only has one comma, and this one, those are both out. The question then becomes, is the material in question an interruption or not? In other words, is the stuff that you might have enclosed within a pair of commas, is it an interruption? Well, if it is an interruption, then you should be able to take those words and only those words out of the sentence and still have a sentence that makes sense and is grammatical. Here, it's not quite going to work, and I'll read it and explain that. So, in a pivotal 2007 article, plant cell biologist showed. So, it doesn't say a plant cell biologist or the world's most famous plant cell biologist. It just says plant cell biologist. That means that these that the words Yuri Lee are not functioning as an interruption or a removable portion of the sentence. That means we don't want commas, and so our answer is going to be C. Small flat structure, so a transition word. I think we're probably going to have four of these, three of these. Small flat structures called spatulae are found at the tips of the hairs on a spider's leg. Ugh. These spatulates temporarily bond with the atoms of whatever they touch. Spiders are able to cling to and climb almost every surface. As a result. I didn't come up with it first, but I was thinking like accordingly. But you know, as a result of these bonds, they're able to cling to things. 
as a result of these bonds. In November 1934, so-and-so was living in what must have seemed like the ideal city for a young artist, Paris. She was studying firsthand the color-saturated color style of France's modernist masters and beginning to make a name for herself as a painter. So she liked Paris and was doing well. She longed to return to her childhood home of India. Only there, she believed, could her art truly flourish. So this means we need a contrast word. And the only one of these that tells us we have any kind of contrast would be A. I mean, it is a sort of specialized contrast, a special kind of contrast, much as with nevertheless or nonetheless or despite this. So it's not as maybe as heavy of a contrast as with however, but again, it's still kind of a contrast. You know, despite the fact that she was doing well in Paris, she wanted to return to India. One more transition word question. Before California's 1911 election to approve a proposition granting women the right to vote, activists across the state sold tea to promote the cause of suffrage. In San Francisco, the Women's Suffrage Party sold equality tea at local fairs. Blank. In Los Angeles, activists so-and-so distributed votes for women tea. Okay, so this would be uh, similarly... And there we go. Yeah, so we have one example. We have a similar example. They could have also said likewise. Similarly. You want to be thinking of groups of words that you, you know, that you make sure that you understand all of them and how they're used and how they group together. Uh, in this case, though, all of these are pretty standard. Um, yeah, they're all pretty standard common words that you will see. Indeed, you can think of as similar to uh, in fact. It means they're going to come back and emphasize what they just stated. Now, these questions might look intimidating at first, but they're really not bad. It's really all about focusing on the instructions in the question portion. So to compare the lengths of the two rail tunnels. And on, honestly, you don't really need to read all of this first. You can come back and verify that it is uh, correct. But let's see. Are they comparing the links of the two rail tunnels? Well, let's make sure we see what the two tunnels are. So those are the two tunnels. Okay, so it's going to have to mention both tunnels. and their lengths. If we notice that C only mentions one of the tunnels, and that doesn't mention anything about their lengths. So these become really, well, so far I haven't seen any that are particularly challenging once you pay attention to the question. If you don't pay attention to the question, yeah, they're going to be challenging. But that would be silly to ignore the question. Okay, the student here wants to provide an explanation and example of, quote, flana. So, flana, plant-animal hybrids, examples, okay. That's not an example. That just says what it is, but it doesn't give an example. That is an example. That does not give an explanation. That gives examples, but doesn't really give an explanation. So here, again, the instructions are key. An explanation, plant-animal hybrids, See, this doesn't, D doesn't tell us that they're plant-animal hybrids. It just says that they're flana. It doesn't explain the term. So that one's going to have to be B. And then last question here. We'll do the same thing. Start with the question, the uniqueness of the accomplishment. Well, what was the accomplishment? That...
there again uniqueness the only one and so that is that